Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Kenny Chen. Kenny has been a pillar of the Pittsburgh robotics and AI community for a while. Um, he worked on AI for Good, the Thrival Festival, and also a co-working space ascender. Uh, these days, Kenny is at the Harvard Kennedy School for Policy, uh, trying to hone those skills. Kenny, welcome to the pod. Hey, Spencer. Thanks so much for having me. It's yeah, great to be here. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think it's been uh, maybe a year and a half or, or so. Um, something what, when I last saw you, I think, um, up around Mount Washington in, in Pittsburgh <laughs> or so, pre, pre-pandemic or maybe like in the early phases of that. But What were you doing in Mount uh, Washington? I have such a horrible memory, like... I, I think it was a it was a um, bacon Tuesdays or uh, um, the, the Shiloh Grill. Yep, Shiloh Grill bacon Tuesday. Oh, I, I, I feel like such an idiot. I'm gonna have early onset Alzheimer's, but it's escaping me. I love that place. I love you, and so that's it's good that we did that. No, yeah, um, I it, it really just like you know clicked with me. Um, yeah, just now somehow. You're right. Um, okay, I, it's I coming back. It's coming back. Exactly how long? Yeah. Yeah, they had that um, picture of that that person that's eating bacon, like it's the last bacon on earth on the menu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, for them it was the the last bacon that they served. <laughs> you know, there. Um, yeah, that that you know. place is under new management. Um, how did yeah. you know that being in in Cambridge? Um, no, uh, I, well, I I think like we might have gone there to catch like one of their last like you know bacon tuesdays uh, um or, or or something like that I, uh, I i don't remember how you sold it to me but i i was i can't believe there. i sold that to you <laughs> but, yeah i um, um I'm, I'm glad i mean honestly whenever i spend time with you i have a good time and um i don't know you're, you're an interesting dude <laughs> so Full disclosure to the listener, by the way, um, Kenny and I actually recorded an hour before this, but there was a recording failure. Uh, some idiot forgot to press the record button, and so we're now we're now kind of doing our our, our uh, redux, as it were. So um, I appreciate you bearing with me on this, and uh, yeah, how good? Different angle, but a good angle. I think the mistake I made last time something like this happened was trying to recreate it too closely. So I like I like your form, mm-hmm. sir. I think just going in and, and trying to just, just have an organic one is, is a good way to play it. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So I still want to kind of dig into um, sort of your, your interest in policy, what you've done in policy. I just know so little about it is the truth. And so I, I want to mm-hmm. understand it. And um, I know I'm not going to get to your level in, in, you know, a one hour conversation or two, but like, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know if you can kind of tell me what got you there, I'd be interested. Yeah, no. And, and by, um, like, I'm, I'm not going to get to your level on, on the robotics or hardware sides of things. Nice that's, that's what makes this fun. Right. You know, um, yeah. all, uh, you know, the, the kind of exchange here. And, um, I feel like, um, you know, for, for me, uh, and, and I think for most people, like understanding what public policy is all about and yeah. how it even works okay, and that's a good operates one. and comes so to be. Back to first it, principles. Yeah, I like it. it it's, uh, it's just kind of like, it's not intuitive at all. And even for people who like work in the space, it also regularly just confounds folks. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, when I think about it from the startup you know world or just like um for ai and robotics companies that are trying to to just do their work and um and just constantly run up against issues either um, in terms of like what kind of reporting you need to do as a um, as a company if you're you know taking investments and you know there's all the different kinds of like sec filings um, you know, uh, uh, regulations governing like trade, imports, exports. You know, uh, now, is that how mostly many for tax purposes, knowing the S- Security Exchange Commission for our viewers. But 
Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, Security and Exchange Commission. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of regulations around like how much uh, uh, how much either Chinese ownership or like em uh, employment of Chinese nationals that U.S. companies can have because of concerns around uh, intellectual property violations, and things related to CFIUS. All of What's this CFIUS? is. Um, CFIUS is the um, Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. Okay, and, and it's that's a very, Chinese entity. Oh, um, it's it's a it's a U.S. U.S. entity, um, foreign meaning anybody. Okay, idiot, mm -hmm. got it. Makes but sense. Um, it, it was it was crafted and designed almost specifically in response to concerns around Chinese IP theft, and so it's a group of people. But, who have the power to um, review and potentially block like Chinese acquisitions and investments in U.S. companies if so, you know things look fishy? And all of I this was, like, policy. I mean, I was involved in a, an initiative to. Um, well, I mean, we we're going for a patent, is what it was. And I remember we were doing research on other patents and uh, we came across the Chinese patent office. And I feel like China thinks of us the same way that our propaganda portrays them, because it basically said, like, anything is on a need to know basis. We see you're in the U.S. Your IP is blocked. Get out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was kind of funny because, I mean, we're sold one story, but that feels like that's not the whole story. Like there's. More going on. There, there's definitely, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of layers to this, you know, clusterfuck of a cake, or, or however <laughs> you might, you know, de describe it. Um, because as complex and oftentimes non, you know, intuitive or even just straight up nonsensical, like U.S. policy and regulations are it just becomes exponentially more complicated and a pain in the ass to deal with when you need to reconcile with as many as like 190 something other countries, you know, respective regulations and um, yeah, approaches to everything from yeah, patent law to, you know, import export, like, you know, uh, you know, processes to, you know, hiring, I, um, whatever. And so if you think of all of this as a, as a game or, you know, a um, an elaborate game of, yeah, you know, a, a massive, it's, it's well beyond monopoly. It's, it's motivating. Like most I mean, I, I think it's people, the most complicated yeah. MM, MMO or it's not MMO. It's like a massive multiplayer, like yeah. role playing game. Well, I used to be a big um, gamer and then I, I, it was addictive and I was spending, you know, a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, I was really into the strategy games like StarCraft, Age of Empires, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And um, amazing stuff, right? It's it's yeah, it's really fun. Um, but then I realized that business can be the same way. And you know, mm -hmm. if you just conceptualize it that way, then you'll enjoy it more. And you know, that same energy can be applied there. And so now I don't allow myself mm -hmm. to play games, but I do do a lot of business. So. Well, you know, if, if you still think of like some of those parallels between um, gaming um, or what it's like to approach and play games versus running a business or, you know, uh, developing new. Um, well, the uh, irony is a lot of those up. businesses are emulating yeah. like Sim Tower, for instance, you know, it's like, right. It, you know, yeah, it's, it, it's coming, you know, full circle in all these ways. Yeah. And. You know, um, there's there's all of the uh, the joys and the frustrations and pains of like being a player. Yeah. And so the best kind of um, analogy I can make, perhaps in, in this case, is that uh, learning policy um, and having a role in shaping it is the equivalent of being an administrator, a moderator, or a game developer that has control over the rules. And is constantly trying to shape and adapt those rules to curb um, and punish like abuses of the system, or you know keep people from exploiting you know uh, loopholes from uh, you know 
ex exerting criminal behavior or other kinds of like um, non desirable activities in your game, um, while also and when you say to, like, criminal like, behavior, I, I, I that's one for me that just to define it, I think you mean malintent, right? Like just doing things that are going to hurt other people or other entities. Um, I, I think um, a lot of times. You know, malintent um, that's not criminal. Okay. You might, you know, um, uh, you might categorize around like incentives. You know, how how do you design a system better so that people can't act on their malintent in terribly harmful ways? But I think in both games and especially in the world of like business or other kinds of governmental transactions, where there's a lot of criminal behavior. Yeah, um, there, there sure. is, you know, um, like those guardrails are there to protect people's lives, their property, their, you know, um, the, the, their rights. So the and intent other is one of thing, the action is another mm -hmm. is what you're saying, mm -hmm. I think. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I've been, uh, yeah, really fascinated by. So there's the just just to rules. clarify and, and drill mm -hmm. it in a little more further home, if that's all right. Oh, please, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my friends says, uh, "My right to swing my fist ends at your face." Is that kind of what you're getting at here? You know, like if you're mm -hmm. messing with somebody else's stuff or well-being, then then that's criminal behavior. Um. It you know, criminal behavior is de defined by the the laws of whatever jurisdiction in which okay. you're. Okay, you're that's, that's way more literal. Okay, got it. Yeah, um, and so I was trying to understand it, philosophically, but I, I see what mm -hmm. you're saying. Um, and yeah, and you know, in, in places where like the right to self defense is explicitly protected, or there's like stand your ground laws and, and other kinds of things. Um, then in some cases, you know, somebody's right to swing their fist, like starts with another person's like fist hitting their face. Um, yeah, and, true. um, you know, so when you look at like technology policy, um, which is, you know, my, my area, and it's just kind of this wild west where, um, most of the regulations that do exist were, uh, created more than two decades ago. You know, everyone's talking about the, uh, talking about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which was like literally from 25 years ago. What is that? I'm um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's it's essentially a 23 word um, piece of that's legislation it? that essentially. Hmm? How did they yeah. do that? That's that's amazing that you can see something that's succinct. It, it's fascinating, right? Yeah. Um, and it pretty much. Um, this is only 25 removed... years ago and they were able to. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, you know, it, it makes it so that internet platforms are not responsible or liable for content posted on their platforms by third parties. Okay. Um, and, you know, there's, there's an entire book on this, like the, the 23 words that shape the internet. It might be like 29 or I, I, I don't know how many it is. But um, those, that set of words, that one sentence is what has allowed Google, Facebook, like, um, you know, pretty much all of social media to exist because those platforms yeah, you wouldn't are be able to have a forum problem. without that because, mm -hmm. I mean, it would just be culpability on, in the eyes of the owners. Not exactly. the eyes, but on the part of, sorry, words mm -hmm. difficult. <laughs> and, and so, you know, people are really up in arms about like Section 230, um, uh, because um, people from all different sides, you know, see, they, they take issue with this. Um, you know, there's a lot of conservatives who think that um, uh, Section 230 grants the Facebooks and Twitters of the world too much power to just moderate um, and, you know, remove presidents or like other kind of uh, bad but actors spreading disinformation. The way you described um, it, it almost seems like the opposite. Like, <laughs> if you allow it to do whatever it wants, then you're you're not you haven't done anything wrong. But I guess that all the yeah. converse of that <laughs> is if you intervene, then that's also okay. Well, it's your property. It's your pro platform. I guess. So you no, you're you you're want. getting it at like the crux of this debate yeah. um, because. Uh, uh, yeah, where conservatives um, 
wants to have an incentive structure where all speech is just allowed to to go out into the world and not be you know, regulated, regardless of how harmful or you know false it all is. Whereas uh, liberals have been looking to make um, uh, make stricter um, you know uh, regulations and hold um, uh, let's see hold these kinds of platforms accountable for moderating specific types of you know speech and interaction that are harmful to people Sounds so very expensive, the, but also you know, maybe worth doing it depends mm-hmm. well, that's interesting um, yeah. I, I don't know that i have a strong opinion on this and so this is this is good it's it's a complex space yeah. um uh you know I, I think another really critical set of issues is just around overall um uh data privacy for for people and you've got you know systems um, where like on on the one hand you've got like Europe and they have um, all sorts of laws and regulations uh, like the like GDPR the General Data Protection you know regulation which um, gives people among the most you know control or access to like their personal data that's held by different companies out of you know anywhere anywhere in the world. Um, and so then you can, you can ask the, a company for your record there and they'll just give it to you. Yes. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's probably least a they're, they're supposed to be asked to. for the company. I mean, as I stated before, mm-hmm. but good for the civilian. Yeah. So I could see that. Yeah. It makes it difficult. Because they though, have to cause... pay a bunch of administrative people to furnish that data. I would think like if, if all the people mm-hmm. in Switzerland are constantly, I don't know if Switzerland does this, but I'm just speculating. You know, if, if all the people in, in a certain country in Europe are, are asking for their data constantly, that's a full-time staff, <laughs> a lot of people mm-hmm. to get that over it, to them. It, it, it really makes for a completely different kind of uh, set of like business model, like calculations there. That, that That's for sure. Um, yeah. And you probably, yeah, you'd probably yeah. write your databases differently if you had to furnish that data. I would think you would, you would just build it in a way where, you know, you could, you could furnish it without having to do anything mm-hmm. because why would you want to pay that whole staff? Exactly. Um, you know, and there's all these different like clauses or, or specific, um, you know, cases that are written into this GDPR where, um, you know, one, one particularly like famous one is the, the right to be forgotten. And so um, the cool. right for people to contact, you know, whether it's it's Google or it's you know Booking.com out of like you know the Netherlands, and to request that Pornhub all of their <laughs> records be expunged from their databases. Yeah. And so you know you've got to design your um, your your backend systems to like That's be able to actually in a do way that. that. They mm-hmm. have that. Do you think that is truly adhered to, or do you think? I mean, it's great, honestly. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, who doesn't want to forget the stuff they posted on Facebook twenty years ago? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, <laughs> um, and and it's a it's a tough space. You know, I, I think there's some um, you know realm of cases where that kind of stuff can be easily done, and then there's just a ton of like really tricky, you know, yeah, messy spaces yeah. where you've got um, data uh, that are shared across like multiple platforms and. Yo, well, and if somebody makes a local and... backup, is is the company that allowed that backup to occur then held responsible, or is that like I wonder, you know? I mean, because there's it seems yeah. like there's a lot of edge cases there, but mm-hmm. and that's that's why you need a, a lot of lawyers at a much higher pay grade than <laughs> than mine to you know <laughs> how manage these kinds of things. Um, but you know, when when you're looking at um, not just a, a national or you know within one company, but a really international kind of you know policy and regulatory context, and you've got to contend with like essentially the Chinas of the world and you know similar kinds of environments, where um, you know pretty much all Chinese companies um, uh, are under. Um, the the jurisdiction and have like a high level of influence by the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, and, you know, the, the I've Chinese heard government. That. Um, and an there's parts of capitalism for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Um, I, I, and, you know, like with many things, there is parts of the American narrative that blow the Chinese like um, situation completely out of proportion. There's a ton of like anti-Chinese like um, you know propaganda and that kind exactly. of stuff. And um, oh, a, about um, uh, just a, so, an American propaganda piece that would blow that out of proportion. I believe you. Yeah. I just, just want to mm-hmm. understand it better. Um, so um, uh, the U.S. is uh, terrified of China's Belt and Road Initiative. What, um, what is this that? Is, just because... Yeah. So believe, um, yeah. this is uh, Xi Jinping's, um, you know, kind of big umbrella hallmark, like, ambition, which is essentially to take the ancient Silk Road concept and revive it for like a modern day era where um, there was a China, belt, I think that's where it started. Um, okay. You know, the idea being to have a both um, a land based and maritime set of like, uh, you know, trading routes, um, whether by rail or, you know, roads, um, ships, canals, like, you know, whatever it is to efficiently manage like you know logistics all all around the world and that was done Um, by command economy so that was a (laughs) top-down approach to managing a series of trading that sounds Mm -hmm. difficult but interesting and but um, yeah you know the 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 concept for the belt and road initiative um originated around like 2013 um that's when you know xi jinping started talking about it and by, I think, 2016, 2017, you know, they, like, built out their 12,000-mile, um, like, um, uh, rail freight line from uh, eastern China all the way to Madrid. Cool. Um, maybe parts of it were, were already there, but, like, you know, did the, uh, yeah, like, crazy stuff like that. Um, what's, what's most concerning, though, to, to the U.S., is the layering of additional kind of infrastructure on top of this, uh, you know, physical infrastructure. So at the same time, you know, China has been uh, expanding their 5G networks and just overall like telecommunications infrastructure, cloud computing. Yeah, They've which... run fiber all across like the eastern coast of Africa over to Europe. I mean, that actually um, sounds kind of sweet, but I, I could see how that might be terrifying given some of China's censorship practices. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, yeah. um, it, how actually, much of the when world I was in high want... school, I, I ran a proxy for a buddy in Beijing so that he could get around the Great Firewall of China. <laughs> so, right? Yeah. That, um, and, and yeah, how, how I don't like you... censorship at all. <laughs> mm-hmm. so it's... you know how how much of uh the world you know would you like to be operating under chinese internet um yeah. uh and you know even even on top of that you know when you talk about any kinds of smart you know technology um <laughs> smartphones smart homes smart cars smart oh, that stuff scares you know, the crap whatever, out of me uh, which I, is i, I you had know, Google assistants in every room of my apartment for a while, and I had to get rid of those things because they were far too creepy. Yeah, and you know, um, it's it, it's one of those curious parallels where uh, you know you yeah you've got all of this. So I'm on like, Duck Duck Go. I have an iPhone now. <laughs> like I kind of <laughs> went the other direction with it. These these highly intrusive data mining like practices by all these American companies, um, sure. and then when you see Chinese companies, you know, do essentially the same thing, um, uh, uh, the U.S. gets like really up in arms, kind of like pointing fingers, you know, about things. Yeah. And by the way, um, you know, I, I just want to be clear, like I um, I am also terrified of China. <laughs> I'm not an apologist for for any of their actions by by any means. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned Taiwan I earlier, think, so I feel like that would be an interesting yeah, tangent. But my family well, Taiwan is, all is like the from Taiwan. That's basically yeah. the people that left China because they were like, "Fuck this!" Right. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's been yeah. described to me. Um, and, and it's almost like a and, libertarian and, vibe, is what I've heard. But I, I could be getting that wrong. Um. 
it's it's a it's a pretty kind of unique and interesting environment there. Um, uh, yeah, like hints of like libertarian you know flavor, lots of kind of uh, progressive liberal policies and, and culture there. Um, a really strong kind of civic technology environment um, that's been cultivated. Uh, but um, but yeah, you know, also this like this stronghold, this tiny, you know, island stronghold <laughs> of, you know, democratic Beautiful. values yeah. um, and, you know, alliance with like the U.S. and the Western world that's like a hundred miles off the coast of, of China and is uh, currently, or at least according to The Economist um, from like an article a couple of weeks ago, is currently the most dangerous place on the planet because... Wait, actually? Um, well, I, I mean, I would think Isn't that the right now, like the Gaza bombed? Strip is, yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. Um, but, in, um, and, and so I, I think that was like just the economist being, you know, a bit dramatic. I wonder but, if Ted Plafker still writes for them. I, I knew his son for a while. Sorry. I'm, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. John Plafker, good kid. This is like the, the kind of shit that keeps me up at night quite, quite literally. Yeah. Um, you know, cause, uh, for, for me where my whole family is from and lives in Taiwan yeah. and I like associate with, you know, a Taiwanese American identity. That's awesome. Um, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I think it's like a beautiful, brilliant, amazing place, but Taiwan, um, you know, we were just saying, like, uh, The Economist wrote this piece on it calling Taiwan the most dangerous place on Earth because it's currently in the crosshairs. It's like right at – it is the country in the middle of a geopolitical tug of war between yeah. the two great powers, the and obviously China. China wants it, yeah. Yeah, it's the one remaining smear on, like, the Chinese – identity that was you know crafted back in like so 1949 um very um they already knocked down hong kong you uh, know uh last year uh, uh, two years ago which also breaks my heart because i yeah. spent a year working there and you know got a lot of friends and yeah, people that I me a little out bit there as well i mean not obviously the same way because i haven't spent time there but i mean just no it's, knowing the background still, of it, it's it's fucked up Seriously, yeah, um, and uh, you know, China is is a patient country. Um, they think generationally more so than by election cycles, but you know, they've also uh, got a lot of plans in motion and, and a lot to prove. You know, especially in terms of, mm -hmm, yeah, and they played the long game on Taiwan for a pretty freaking long time. And, uh, you know, the, the chances of them mounting some kind of like armed, you know, invasion or, you know, trying to, to take anything by force within the next five to seven years is, is not trivial. And, um, you know, th this is another important aspect of public policy, which isn't just like writing the rules of engagement for business or for other kinds of things, but also like navigating the conflicts and, you know, claims to ownership and to all sorts of action that, you know, countries and have so or try to exert, you know. My first girlfriend's grandfather had his piano thrown down the stairs by the Red Guard when they were taken over. I, um, yeah, one of, one of my favorite people I work with had a similar experience. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of love for that government either. Um, just based on people I've known that have been adversely impacted by it. Um, but obviously there's power there. And so that that's, that's an interesting piece. Um, I had more of a point here, but I feel like I lost a little bit. I apologize. No, no. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's terrifying and, you know, infuriating when you have to deal with systems of government um, that uphold policies or practices that are just clearly unjust or yeah. like, you know, corrupt and fucked up to their core. For sure. Um, 
and you know when we were going through the the Cold War and you know this whole the the decades of like ideological existential struggle between like capitalism and communism and yeah. you know the ideas of like how is the world order actually going to pan out um, you know at, at this crux of things you know the 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 U.S. and China people call this like the new Cold War. There's definitely some some differences. Um, you oh, know, it's sure. not so much fought by nukes, and you know, less around like. Well, my family is Russian by or, origin too, so that's an interesting oh, yeah. one. <laughs> or we yeah. here, right? So it's similar, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but but uh, you know, even if like we've been fighting more on economic terms, um, you know, and and you know, other kind of commercial or you know, GDP oriented like measures for, for success and influence. Um, you know, there's, there's still a, a ton of maneuvering for, um, for influence that's, that's going on. And, uh, this belt and road initiative with oh, China see. essentially having, you know, 140 countries now that are part of its belt and road. Wait, what? And connect so yeah, there's 180, 180 countries altogether, and all but 40 of them have, have gotten involved? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Interesting. Um, it might be 40 to 60 or, or so, but yeah, um, yeah, 140 yeah, countries have, have signed MOUs with, um, with China and have uh, either begun or completed... For our viewers. Sorry, I just... Oh no no! Acronyms please, are yeah. kind of a pet peeve. <laughs> please continue to like, um, yeah, uh, hit me on those things. All, but, all good. Um, you've you've been good to me, and I'll try to be good to you. <laughs> um, but but yeah, you know, you've got China that's not only been developing their physical in infrastructure, the roads, bridges, buildings, you know, um, all of those kinds of things. They've also been developing the telecommunications networks, you know, with um, uh, with phone, with five G. Extending you know, lines, that is interesting too. Internet. I never even thought about mm -hmm. that. Like, if you've got a censored internet that's going into more countries, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that, that's that's influential to a, in a way that I never considered. Absolutely, and and when you think about, um, yeah, you know, all all of the. Everything that we attribute to, like smart infrastructure, or um, you know the the benefits of that, you you look at the energy grid um, across a lot of you know developing countries or even you know fairly developed countries, and China being the world's largest producer of uh, solar panels, like you know, know photovoltaic like panels and all I that kind of it. stuff. I didn't know it. But that's yeah, I, I think they've got at least you know seventy percent of global that's market the number share. I was thinking. In, I won a lot of uh, counting the uh, the candy corns in the jar competitions as a kid. I'll say that. <laughs> Solid, yeah, intuition there, and yeah, um, you know, uh, they've they've. I think they might also be be tops when it comes to like uh, wind production as well. Um, they they might have added over a hundred gigawatts. I would have thought someone renewable but energy. I, I believe you, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and so you know. You got transportation, energy, telecommunications um, uh, infrastructure. You know the actual manufacturing um, process from resource extraction through, like you know, production of uh, things. They're also honing in on human capital. You know, education, training, and uh, talent um, uh, sourcing. From from all around the world, international you know, essentially about Okay, that's cool. Cool. Um, you answered my question as I was asking it. I appreciate that. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and so you know they when they've developed such a uh, such a comprehensive and you know generally efficient you know albeit still with some flaws here. Uh, yeah, you know any number of flaws. Um, there's there's still clear reason for the U.S. to like be freaked out because that's a healthy uh, this, way to look at it. By the way, the fact that you're considering not only the negative but also the positive of that that system, I think, is the only way you're going to open mm -hmm. a dialogue. And so, as a policymaker, I mean, I, this mm -hmm. is me as an idiot. Don't don't know this area, but no. trying to understand as a human as best I can. I mean, that that seems like the right way to go about it. 
I mean, um, because you wanna... acknowledging the positives, right? Correct. I um, mean, to open a dialogue, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think you're um, you're sounding like a much more you know reasonable like um, you know uh, you're taking a much more reasonable uh, approach to that as opposed to what has been the standard for most people on Capitol Hill, which is to <laughs> vilify and on those just, guys. <laughs> yeah, you know, try to paint China as just like enemy number one and everything that, do? that China like, does what's is the, terrible. What's the purpose of that? You know, like, okay, so like, I know politics are cancer to conversation, but your public policy, I feel like we can talk about that in this episode. And mm -hmm. so what, what purpose does it serve to, to put a wedge between you know like different cultures and different like like how does that help anybody like i, I don't know i mean i mm -hmm. i'm not a huge fan of donald trump but one thing i did like that he did was talking to north korea you know because nobody mm -hmm. else was doing that and so i feel like just opening dialogues and and communication is, is generally positive in my opinion and i'm not a, i'm not a like i said i'm not a fan of trump and and you know, maybe mm -hmm. this is too political for me to say, but you know, fuck it, I'm saying it. So, let's go there. Yeah, like I like I'm, that he did I'm, that. I'm I'm with you. I I think I'm also somebody who um, more fundamentally believes in uh, in diplomacy and you know the ability you for to. people to find like areas of agreement. Common ground. They're better angels. Common ground, exactly. Um, but. Uh, what I've learned about like the global kind of um, policy environment is that actually a a fair amount, if not the majority of the world, um, doesn't necessarily prioritize things in that way. Um, uh, what they do prioritize is uh, survival, um, you know, self sufficiency. Um, Makes sense. What um, what people call uh, realism as an actual like academic um, area of, of theory. I would draw which, a line between self-sufficiency and survival, but they definitely do go hand in hand in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, but realism, I, I could get that. Okay. I, yeah. I where, you know, if, if you're thinking of countries in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs yep, and like it. the bottom rung is... <laughs> You need to survive. You need to make sure Don't that die. everybody else killed. doesn't come kill you yeah. um, and stuff. Then you've got the U.S. that has faced you you know, years, everybody. if not Sorry. like, you know, yeah, you know, the, the U.S. Yeah. has been the biggest player on the block, has For been the bully in the playground. But not that long, like 200 years, yeah. right? Um, I, I'd say maybe like 30 years, like, yeah. you know, since the end That's of the, the Cold War. Or, you don't I mean, think World maybe War II since really like made World it War II. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe eighty. No, I, I, yeah. Eighty. I, well, so like they they were kind yeah, of dichotomous think, with Russia up mm -hmm. until they collapsed. You're right in the eighties, and so yeah, yeah. yeah, I could buy that. Um, in terms of like kind of uh, singular hegemonic global dominance, like you know, it, but yeah, still that that like thirty to to eighty years. Um, and it's been a while since like the U.S. has been has been challenged by, you know, um, by the kid on the playground that like just got their growth spurt and <laughs> actually turns out to have like some Hulk genes in them and That's is just growing like crazy. And they're also bringing along with them a lot of the other like outcasts, you know, the, the immigrant children who have been like cast out or ignored by the popular kind of like um, uh, white Western Anglo-Saxon, like American um, kind of popular kids. Yeah. And now, you know, China's bringing I mean, along. I got made fun of for being Jewish a lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, that, yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a, a tough thing section of things but yeah you, you know, know there's there's that. this kind I, of like power struggle that out but yeah yeah um and and so yeah you know it, it seems like the playbook for most u.s pop uh politicians is that um you know you don't say good things about china 
Yeah. You say bad things about China, and you make sure that as many of the other countries in the world only hear the bad things about China, so that they don't join. You don't think that's domestic? The, the China like, side of the, the playground. Well, this is me as an outsider looking in, you know, from a naive perspective. But I would think that if you would uh, to badmouth China, I would think that'd be more for the voters in the U.S., right? Like people that have a preconceived notion that China is evil. Mm -hmm. If you say bad things and they maybe, I don't know, I could be wrong on this. I'd like to be corrected if I am. It's, it's definitely a combination. Um, you know, I think for American voters, um, I, I might even venture to say that uh, the China issue hasn't really even reached like a kind of a, a priority status or like a fever pitch to, to drive um, uh, people. You know, right now it, or, or more recently, it's been um, racial justice and the police. And it's been, you know, the, um, you know, uh, stop the steal versus like steal? fighting disinformation. And, you know, what, what the, the kinds the of like, I, I, I'm kind of remain attaching naive on some of these issues, but I want to, Oh yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it, uh, the stop the steal, the big lie, you know, essentially, um, it, you know, Trump's narrative that the 2020 election was stolen from Got him it. Okay. and that, you know, Joe Biden is not the legitimately elected, like you are still doing that. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, Got and, it. um, it seems like, uh, the majority of Republican, you know, uh, lawmakers have fallen in step with like, continuing to try to delegitimize the 2020 election. Um, not because they actually believe it as logical, you know, human beings who it's can the thing like, to think do and reason. a Republican lawmaker, it sounds like. Exactly. Um, it's that difference between uh, what they know to be true or to be right versus what, what their base um, would view as favorable. Mm -hmm. And maintains their political survivability. Yep. Um, as opposed to, you know, Liz Cheney, who, um, you know, daughter of, of Dick Cheney, who was like the sole Republican voice that were still just like trying to say, wake up, sheeple. Like, oh, geez. It do you like her dad. realize, yeah, <laughs> do you realize the, 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 the shit that's like coming out of your, your mouths? And they voted her um, out of all of her kind of like uh, leadership roles um, and things. So, you know, uh, a lot of a well, lot I respect of this about Dick Cheney. I mean, not that I I love him, but what I respect is that he managed to run things kind of low key from behind the scenes. It seems he wasn't that behind the scenes. I mean, we know who he is, but yeah, I don't know. I, I try to kind of stay back a little bit in my work and not be too egotistical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh, no, it's, it's a, it's a, honestly, it's a scary space. I think, you know, yeah. the, well, I mean, more, good, good on you for having the balls to enter it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's still going to continue being this kind of, uh, calculus of, um, how, how much of those, you know, balls I have to, to stay <laughs> in it and to like keep going, further down the rabbit hole into like the really scary shit and to try to uh yeah, try yeah. to do something about it i mean I'll, I'll be honest like i i try to not even well this is gonna be unpopular if i say this but you know we can edit this out if we need to i, I try not to watch the news because i feel like my ability to influence it as a non-policy maker is so negligible compared to what someone like you can do and so i'll stick to what i'm good at that's making robots you know and that's my specialty but if you want to specialize in policy you can make a difference there and, and i fully support that and so i mean does that make sense or am i it it does i feel no, like I, I feel I, like i'm gonna get crap for that and you know if i do you know cancel me unsubscribe whatever you want to do no, please no, don't I mean, but if you do it's okay no, I, th I think at the very least, you know, that that's that's far from at least what I would consider to be, you know, a, a cancelable. Uh, 
set of thoughts. But you know, I, I would encourage though, not not just for you, but for um, anyone working in uh, robotics, advanced technologies, you know, those kinds of spaces, to um, uh, to understand that you might have more power and influence in these spaces than you might give yourselves credit for. I mean, I have influence um, within robotics, but that's not policy. I mean, that's not, you know, nuclear but, weapons or, you know, mm -hmm. trade on a major scale, trade on a minor scale, maybe, but. Um, but, you know, when, when you think about, um, so, so maybe nuclear weapons are like the, like a, Different situations. So well, that's just big mostly military. Yeah, really is what it yeah. is. Uh, but when you look at AI robotics, you know um, the the data, the te uh, the component technologies, the talent, the human capital, and all of the different like industries and use cases in which they're they're deployed. Um, this is currently at the crux of kind of that battleground that, that I was just, you know, talking about between the US and China, between any number of countries that are trying to even stay competitive in a fast changing and evolving like global environment. And so everybody like covets and, you know, uh, prioritizes their ability to access and develop these exact technologies. And in those cases, you know, actually across the entire board, um, the the number of people who actually know what the fuck they're talking about when it comes to technology, and also opt in to even step foot into uh, policy related conversations is so scarce and limited, where anybody who wants to, not saying that it has to be you, but any roboticist who gives a damn about how robotics as a whole are going to be like used and deployed and, and governed um, has a ton of opportunity and like waiting rooms and ears where people want to invite them into boards and commissions and you know trade associations and other yeah, kinds of structures time. where yeah, they're having conversations with the policymakers and are like a critical line of defense to make sure that the people writing these laws or deciding to wage wars also have the information that they need That's so that they don't do stupid shit. Maybe it's just the cynic in me, but I feel like so often when I get asked to be on a board, it's just symbolic. Like people just want someone that, I mean, this is very cynical. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm sorry for that, but there's a lot of different kinds of boards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sounds good. I mean, so. not, I mean, all right. So if I live longer, I might, I might see that. And you know, I don't want to be disillusioned. I don't want to have a foregone conclusion here. Um, I do like people. I mean, as you know, I mean, I'm, you know, pretty gregarious and, and enjoy, you know, everything, but yeah, no, I mean, keep going, please. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I think I, um, I, you know, I, I, I at least delivered, um, that message and, you know, again, uh, it, it doesn't have to be, um, a, a you right now or anyone specifically, like uh, right now, but the the world is going to continue changing very rapidly. Um, you know, oftentimes where like you know our 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 truth and reality seems stranger than fiction. Um, you know, the fact that um, um, uh, what is it? Oh, yeah. One of one of the um, when I was talking about like data privacy and security earlier. Um, the example I was going to throw out is like China's social credit system where yeah. the entire Oh, that is so weird to me. Right. You know, yeah. they've got this, the most sophisticated, like practically universal surveillance, you know, system, yeah. um, with, you know, uh, accurate enough, like facial recognition and all of these other kinds of like biometrics 
where they know everything about every person. Um, and this, the, perhaps the scariest part is that a lot of Chinese citizens are actually in favor of it um, oh, because they've seen that the deployment of the social credit system has reduced crime, has um, improved uh, congestion, has uh, resulted in more donations to well, So I, I said this in our last episode, like define crime, and, and I know you did, but I'm just saying this <laughs> again for the sake of reiterating the argument. It depends on the locality which with that crime yeah. is being enforced. And that is highly <laughs> subjective in my opinion, which I'm saying now. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting. I think um, within China, um, it's it's not so subjective, or at, at least, you know, there is- Well, is it political very, crime? Is it- No, it's it's mostly um, kind of like petty- Like uh, Robin people. Every day. Okay. Um, things like that though, like you've got- people reporting right. each other in the social credit system when they see somebody litter or when they see somebody like, you know, deface like property or, um, you know, it used to be that people would like piss on the streets and, and stuff. But now like yeah. uh, people are reporting each other for public indecency. But I mean, that's um, almost Nazi-esque, don't you think, to turn the populace against one another in order to further the government's needs? Mm -hmm. It. It absolutely is, and it's you know it's the the what drives some of the dystopian terror. But when you think about the say eighty to ninety percent of Chinese citizens who are not you know committing um, crimes or acts of public indecency, nor are they the people who are actively involving themselves in reporting stuff. They're just like living their own lives, and within the last two years, they've seen just a significant reduction in things that they don't otherwise like to see on a daily basis or like <laughs> just inconveniences. And he's like, yeah. you know what? Like my life seems to have gotten kind of like easier and, and nicer. dude with his dick out of the subway is gone. I uh, don't have to worry about <laughs> getting mugged on the way exactly. to work every day. All right, this is all and, right. And not only yeah. that, like because I haven't been rocking the boat and I've maintained a good social credit score, I've been getting all these perks. Like, you know, I've been getting discounts on my like uh, on my airfare. Interesting. And Wait, actually, um, I, I, I get it. Yeah. You, know, you, you get an airfare. It, so China has enough of a stake in the airlines in the area that they can give you a discount on airfare if your social credit score is high. And rail and you know entertainment <laughs> hospitality, um, you know most uh, most of China's right. largest businesses are all state owned that air is enterprises. Such an interesting, so they can do whatever they want. I mean, I've I've heard this, but I'm I'm really just now internalizing it. The juxtaposition between capitalism and communism there is is fascinating. I mean, that's that's what it is. It's a hybrid. I mean, mm -hmm. you're describing it, and it's it's obvious. To, yeah, that's that's amazing. You're yeah, you're nailing it. It's 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 like a living um, contradiction. There's so many things that don't quite make sense, but somehow that's the way it is and functions. Um, and well, I think they're creating an incentive unsettling. to further the needs of the state. Is is how it reconciles, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and the incentive the being capitalistic, the needs of the state being communistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, whether it's uh, uh, communism with capitalistic uh, characteristics or it's capitalism with Chinese characteristics, like these are all you know terms that Chinese pop, uh, politicians have, have thrown around for, for years. Um, but, you know, when you consider how those kinds of norms, um, uh, you know, root themselves, not just in the, in the country, but like, you know, they, they haven't started deploying the social credit system in other countries that they're building. Oh, all of the, they just control the internet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and they will, uh, they will, they haven't gotten there yet, but they're going to, I mean, yeah. I had to speculate.
you know, who's installing the, the security cameras in Venezuela or for any number of... Uh, Wait, China controls uh, the internet in Venezuela? No, I, I, I actually don't know. But I think it's more like in African countries. Correct. Uh, China's yeah. actually, um, you know, sold... Uh, I mean, they're the, they're the primary supplier, um, not just of like... Well, Africa the, the technology has and been that way for a while. I mean, China's been... Mm -hmm. Yeah, expanding. and China's willing to yeah. give them aid and support development projects, infrastructure, without all of the strings attached that the U.S. and other you know Western countries have. Where you know the U.S. isn't going to deal with an autocratic or dict dictatorial regime if they're still committing like human rights abuses or just <laughs> straight up genocide. China, they're like, um, you want? All right, sign on the dot. <laughs> like, Do all the genocide, um, but you're going to use our censored internet. Yeah. That's interesting. It, it's just like, you know, shh. Yeah, we also do that. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the treatment of like the Uyghur Muslims is, you know, completely abhorrent. And, um, you know, it, it's another facet of this kind of like dystopian um, in, environment that that we live in, where you know the the, the concentration camps, the re-education like facilities um, that they, they call like all of these. It these was things Cambodian just, thing like, originally, right? Just, if mm -hmm. I understand it correctly, okay. But it it still um, exists. I mean, for sure. I mean, that's an incredibly fucked up facet of humanity right now in my opinion there's not many things yeah. i care about kenny but you've got to understand that's one of them mm -hmm. yeah. no i i i appreciate that um, thank you I'm, I'm, and and i'm glad you do um and you know um though i th i think what's um and what's what makes it so uh so hard to wrestle with is that at the same time you have the two opposite ends of the spe the spectrum you know some of the most inhumane like terrible practices while at the same time some of the most unbelievable like achievements of <laughs> human civilization that are happening it's and, an interesting you know, dichotomy right like, because when yeah. you think about the pyramids, I mean, I'm getting philosophical here because this isn't current events, but mm -hmm. this is a thought exercise I've been doing lately. When you think about the pyramids, the um, the kings in Egypt had this obsession with being remembered, right? Mm -hmm. And so they enslaved an entire race <laughs> in order to build this project. Yeah. And it's, it's hilarious in a way because, I mean, well, it's, it's terrifying, but it's also hilarious in retrospect because time heals all. We look at people like Adolf Hitler as totally evil and fucked up, but we look at Genghis Khan as being an interesting historical figure. They're very similar, mm -hmm. but because it's been so long, That's a good point. we look mm -hmm. at Genghis Khan as being somehow, you know, military genius or whatever we, we say, you know. Whatever but, revision is history, correct? We apply you know, but, that. But, yeah. I mean, he was in several ways more evil. You know, I mean, I, obviously Hitler was incredibly evil. But I'm saying this because I, I think it's interesting the way we look at things in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you know, there's uh, there's whatever you might say about like um, what any just evil regime does uh, to build things, invent things, you know, whatever it is. Um, but when you're when you look at the argument around China, um, and uh, la I think it was last year, they essentially um, declared that they had eradicated poverty. No, in, that's bullshit in China. Um, I mean, they defined the, their own kind of like metrics and thresholds for what okay. poverty means. Yeah, that makes sense. But, um, uh, you know, 
like yeah even even if you, you can have eradicate some poverty. percentage I mean, maybe you can if you if you just give those people money which is what they might have done but yeah well um i think it was within the past decade or so um you know china having brought um something on the order of 700 million people from um, below, um, yeah, from like abject poverty into what is the equivalent of like a middle class um, consumer. Did they change like, the definition you know, of poverty like, or did they actually give those people more stuff? Um, they, it's, it's a combination of people having in, increased in if, if not like kind of multiplied their households you know income or their like purchasing power um, paired with uh, just expanded um, like resources social services and amenities that have like raised the floor of making sure that people have like food housing and access to like you know, health care and, and, and stuff. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, crazy what, um, <laughs> what they're able to do when they just like hand down the orders and don't really need to, uh, yeah, no, I have I mean, workers that yeah. will advocate for that. And, you know, like they built 30 hospitals and I'm just like, yeah, but at what cost? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. not to hate on China because I I don't you know. No, I I I <laughs> I don't like any of um, what's happening in China, um, and <laughs> and it's and it's f so frustrating to reconcile with um, you know the the and that's what makes it so hard to reconcile with like the merits and the achievements of of what they're doing as well as to, um, to reconcile with um, their arguments or their criticisms of, of the US, where it's like so many of these, um, uh, these, these jabs that we throw at each other Typical. are two-way streets. You know, yeah. We talk about like their human rights record. They talk about like, you know, our 400 year history of slavery that still hasn't been, <laughs> um, so our human uh, rights record is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. it's just been an insidious evolution of that into a, you know, into a prison state, um, that like continues to oppress, um, people of color within like the U S they're not lying. Um, I might they're, add, they're not, they're just calling out the straight up, you know, hypocrisies that uh i mean they the, say the those US who live in glass houses just... but i guess that's the game <laughs> <laughs> um and and so you know i i feel like going back to your point about like um that kind of dialogue you know having people actually acknowledge both the merits and the 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 cost and detriments of both systems, like you know, what's good and bad about China, what's good about and but what bad it about sounds China. like, and not just talk propaganda, like it, yeah, and propaganda is just the detriments, right? It's like mm -hmm. this is how my enemy fucked up. Remember that they fucked up. That's my enemy. Remember mm -hmm. them for what they fucked up and not the good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and, and not the same things that that we fucked up on. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we 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 use different <laughs> words for that. Yeah, no, they're, they're terrorists. They're not people that we chose to kill because they didn't agree with us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where we're going. Um, you know, uh, if can I say you've got US... a tremendous set of balls on you, Kenny, to go into this realm? I don't possess that. I, I am a pussy by comparison. I mean, pussy. People say yeah. pussies are warm and inviting and they're great. I agree. <laughs> However, <laughs> what I mean is a coward. And so I don't have the courage you do to go into that. I am so, 
I admire you for having the gonads to, to be able to actually look at that stuff head on. I really do. I appreciate that, but I'm, um, I'm not counting you out of, of this fight. Um, and <laughs> I, I hope you don't do so. So don't either. Count me in just at least, <laughs> no, no, no. Like, and, and, you know, again, it doesn't require like, you know, uh, like a, like an opt in, uh, right now, but you know, as, as long as you like keep some of these things in the back of your mind and, uh, have it, uh, have it in, inform or, or even just like be a present thought um as you uh engage with different like companies clients um you know you know do things like having that perspective awareness um actually you know can, so, can really make a huge difference like within industries and these like spaces what i think you're saying is consider the ethical implications of the contracts we enter into that's a great place to, yeah, to, to start and, and to focus on. I think I do that. <laughs> I try to do that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think like ethics um, is, is a really, um, it's, it's become a really overloaded term. It's, it's oh, come to I, mean so many things and, you I'm know, proud of this. not enough things. Um, and, and so as, as much as I, um, will continue to advocate for like ethical and responsible, like approaches to things, um, I'm also deep enough into this now where the realist in me is, you know, also, uh, coming to bear with the fact that there are segments of this space that don't operate around like you know ethical principles well, the problem to is begin it's with not cut and dry i mean ethics is yeah. subjective and so mm -hmm. i mean I, I went to business school i took business ethics i mean my dad went to medical school he had medical ethics yeah um and that stuff exists but the problem is it's subjective i mean well it mm -hmm. is and it isn't um in in a poorly taught ethics class, you're learning the ethics of your professor. It's a soapbox for them. In a well taught ethics class, it's um, objective and, and you're looking at the study of ethics from an overarching perspective. Mm -hmm. And I had that later in my academic career and I was lucky to have had that. Mm -hmm. um, I've only ever gotten three C's in school. And uh, they were ethics, uh, psychology 101, and a class on vampires <laughs> at the University of Pittsburgh. And I posit to you the reason I got C's is because I could not take the knowledge of that professor seriously. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I was a straight A plus student all through most of my academic career. I believe uh, it. But this it's nonsense. It's, it's just... You know, it's, it's, well, it's all nonsense, but I don't want to crap on academics in particular because it's different. No, I mean, you know, um, the, the, the rules are made up and the grades don't matter. Correct. <laughs> Ultimately. Yeah. And I'm glad you're intelligent enough to realize that because it's true. Um, it's but also I, what I'm telling myself because I'm not getting straight A's. <laughs> That's for sure. So in master school, I did not get straight A's either. I got a lot of B's. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's challenging. But yeah. Kick my ass. Um, so I've got a question for you, which is uh, just, you know, what what keeps you up at night? Oh, um, so many you know, things, Kenny. If, um, yeah. Or, or, yeah, I, I am an insomniac for over a decade now. <laughs> if I, if, so okay, so you want to know the yeah, truth? shoot with anything you want, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll fire from the hip, as it were. Um, so I recently took a trip to the Czech Republic, and I was able to sleep without Ambien on that trip. It was beautiful, because I could never do that. <laughs> and so... 
what I think it was, was just not being on a high stress job. Mm. I have a good friend who was the director of operations at a multi tens of million dollar company. Mm. And she also was on Ambien and we bonded over it. <laughs> and a good friend of mine to this day. Um, and maybe this is a thing to put on my sleeve that I shouldn't on this, but yeah, you know, it's about honesty. So whatever. I mean, we'll let it out if we need to. I don't think we do. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Colin Powell takes Ambien, right? I mean, it's <laughs> when you're working on high stress stuff, it is very hard to sleep. And by high stress, I mean like, um, well, in Colin Powell's case, I mean, determine if people live or die. In my case, yeah. it's, you know, making sure companies can meet their deadlines. It, lower yeah. stress, honestly. But like, I mean, I, I said to my dad once, who's an orthopedic surgeon, I said, um, grad school is killing me. I'm so stressed out. He said, you're stressed. Try operating on somebody with a 20 minute tourniquet time that could bleed on a minute. You're stressed. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I, I, I get his like, you know, argument there. Um, if, if you're just going to treat everything in the world as apples and, and compare them that way. But I, um, yeah, I, I also am, you know, very much of the mind that like people's individual contexts, um, cannot be like easily, um, uh, compared, contrasted in those kinds of ways. And sure. yeah, everyone's like challenges and, and struggles are entirely legitimate if only because of the experiences that, that, that people feel because of them, or at the very least, I'm never going to denigrate somebody's like, you know, uh, uh, you know, challenges with things unless like their issue is that, you know, Kim Kardashian hasn't like, (laughs) um, I'm sorry. I I heard Kim Kardashian start giggling immediately. Can you reiterate that? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I refuse to say that <laughs> um, <you. laughs> on that on that front. But um, yeah, um, okay. So no, I'm Kardashian. Who cares? I got it. <laughs> um, I, I think I remember the last phone call we had, or, or yeah, when we were talking about this, and you were like, "Oh man, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been up for forty hours straight." Like I do that on, on a like, regular basis. Yeah, um, but I love it. I mean, the masochism is real. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so. No, and it, it's it's an impressive like ability and, and superpower that I'm a like, stoic, um, Kenny at heart. I am very much a stoic, <laughs> and so I want people around me to succeed, and I will kill myself mm-hmm. to make that happen. <laughs> I, I I feel you. There's um, you know there's so much that like I resonate with and and share on that front and. Um, I, I, I wish I still had, um, whatever fortitude or, uh, bodily like functions to be able to still pull like, you know, multiple all nighters and all of that. I do two a week on average. Yeah. Most people haven't um, done three in their life. I've probably pulled over a thousand. (laughs) Yeah, it is what it is, um, but I mean, you know, you're one person and you want to make a maximum impact. Now it's like, um, you know, during my time in Pittsburgh and especially when I was, um, you know, uh, working for, for Ascender and Thrival and, you know, was, was you know, starting and, and, and running my think tank and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it would be just lots of like 100 hour weeks and, and those kinds of things. And um, the there's something shirts? special. Um, Sorry, I'm listening to you first. And then oh, get into it. oh, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something special. It's like a privilege, you know, to be so like, uh, to care so much to be so passionate and dedicated to one's work and the people that, you know, you feel accountable to, to like, pour yeah, that I agree. Yourself into that line of work. There's no um, better and, feeling than doing right for the people that have done right by you. Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing. And I, I, I kind of, I, I miss it. 
you know, really, to be honest. Um, and then there's, there's the other part of me where like, um, uh, f for the last several years, I have not had all that much issue like falling asleep because <laughs> I, I, I usually only sleep when I'm like, exhausted and I inadvertently pass out like nice. at a, at a desk or it's just like, I can hit the heavy bag, drag on myself. Hmm? <laughs> I'll hit the heavy bag a lot and tough times when I can't sleep these days and do push ups just to wear myself out and go to sleep. That, Hey, that's, that's a, that, that's a great approach. Um, and yeah, use you know, it, you it does, it does sound like you've just, um, I, I don't know if it's like the the neural pathways that like regulate sleep or you know the the things that you've just um, either fried or like um, just uh, dominated. <laughs> um, We're plastic. Uh, we can dominate. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I had much more of a point than just like commiserating or, or like you know sharing some of that um, that that feeling about what it means to um, to approach work in that way, but then you know to also have like a complicated uh, relationship with what it means to to sleep and you know arguably try to take care of oneself. Yeah. I feel you. And I mean, I, <laughs> I have a therapist who asked me the other week, you know, can you commit, can you commit to seven hours of sleep a week? And I said, not if I have to let someone down at work. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I said, um, nobody likes that guy that says they have to sleep. And so they don't finish their job at the office. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to be a cunt here, but what, what I'm trying to say is we've all worked with that person that's like, I've got to go, I've got a camping trip this weekend. And yeah. I'm just mm -hmm. like, I've been killing myself for a month to make this happen, and you've got a camping trip. It's okay to enjoy yourself. I, I travel internationally. Mm -hmm. I, I try to live life to the fullest, but that includes working hard. Yeah, And I think a lot of people don't understand that aspect. I mean, you don't have to. I'm not trying to dictate how you should be to everybody and every one, but at least when you're trying to push the envelope of what humans can achieve, you kind of have <laughs> to kill yourself a little bit. And so... Totally. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I've, I've also you know experienced some of that like... Um, <laughs> Uh, those those moments of like being worn down to the, like the last thread, and then you know the um, seeing someone else and just thinking, "Oh, go fuck yourself." Like, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but but at the same time, you know, I, I think like at the end of the day, we're the most accountable to ourselves and like Correct. the expectations and the commitments that, that we set. And yeah. I think the thing that I realized powered by um, self loathing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think the hardest thing to come to terms with is that fine line between ambition or even just like, you know, work ethic and those kinds of values. All of those There's positive that things that we part. attribute. Yeah. Um, well, so those things on one end and the fine line between that and self-delusion where They're very you know, similar. we can. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. I mean, we're, we're one of the things that the human brain is most effective at is rationalization. That's this whole like, sure. you know, yeah, our, our like prefrontal cor um, cortex and like all of that kind of well, stuff. Well, prefrontal Just, cortex is a lot of stuff, but that's one of them. <laughs> Like, yeah, or you know, our our ability to just like convince ourselves that whatever it is that we're doing is the right thing to do, even if um, it means like, hey, you know, I'm gonna deprive myself of you know food, sleep or the friends, next or food, sleep, love, um, sanity, the touch of another human, sanity <laughs> for an indefinite period of time Ten due years. to yeah. my like 
idea that I might still be able to more effectively execute on this set of tasks and responsibilities than if I rethought my, you know, allocation of, you know, time and energy. And, and I have an interesting things. philosophical point that, so a friend of yeah, mine please. mentioned this and I didn't say anything, well, because I thought better of it, but, you know, we've been drinking and I'm going to anyway. And so um, it was this. So there's an exercise in artificial intelligence. It's, there's a paperclip factor. You've probably heard this. Mm -hmm. the paper oh, yeah, yeah. Factory the, the directive is to only make yeah. paper clips. And so the idea is, um, you know, nothing else matters. And, and it goes to the extent where all resources get used up, and human beings are now an implant to paper clips. It's mm -hmm. like, I'll have your potassium, all of it. I need that to make paper clips. Yeah. You know, and so I thought about that, and it did kind of weigh on me for about a week. And, um, after a while, I thought, are humans, is, is the real artifact, is human intelligence that much worse? You think of Mao Zedong, Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. Pol Pot, you know, I mean, a bunch of others. Those people had a variable they were trying to optimize for, racial purity, you know, whatever you want to call it. They did atrocious shit. I mean, why are we so worried about AI? Because human intelligence is just as bad. I hate to say it. But like, I mean, can be. I, I, I want to say can be because all that stuff can do great good as well. I'm, I'm with you though. Like, um, you know, uh, aside from like US-China tensions in World War Three, like, you know, another one of the things that keeps me up at, at night. Sure. Um, or at least more um, idiomatically, because, you know, obviously I don't have issues like passing out. Um, I is, uh, so, yeah, you know, the, the idea of what a, um, what a dystopian like AI, you know, future looks like. Yeah. And, you know, I am far less concerned about, you know, super intelligent, like sentient AI just doing crazy shit on its own. And more even the um, the the misuse and manipulation of relatively weak AI by fucked so up. So you're human still concerned about societies. fucked up human nature. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, um, ultimately with us as humans, like our most critical existential, ethical, and other concerns also end up finding their origins in human actions and, and roots. And so there isn't going to be an AI that- So the social or, credit system you know, is a good example of this, I feel like. Absolutely. Yeah. Because um, there's a weak AI. I mean, that's, it's, it's, maybe it's, it's humans even, all the way down. Yeah, yeah it's you know, not even really AI. AI. Yeah. It's ranking. It's people mm -hmm. deciding and then a weighted average, I think. Yeah, I'm sure there's more to it than that, but that's the naive understanding. Now, I, what I think would be really interesting, um, you know, there's there's this whole realm of like, um, not artificial intelligence, but augmented augmented intelligence, and you know, the kind of like um, the, all all the different philosophies and approaches to. Um, uh, symbiotic or like, you know, um, augmentation of like human capabilities. Um, uh, and when I think about like this topic that we were just talking about with, um, you know, how do we best like balance our, our, our lives or choose between, you know, these kinds of decisions of, uh, when to sleep, when to relax, when to like, you know, continue working. Um, if we treat ourselves as, as machines working every or, time. yeah, like think about, um, the, uh, the, the, the loss functions or the approaches to optimizing our individual human throughput. And I definitely do then, that. That's how you yeah. break the curve. That's how you beat everybody else is by optimizing. Yeah. Uh, unless you have just like a deeply biased kind of set of models that are governing your behavior and you're determining for yourself like 
I am always going to choose to like destroy myself and self flagellate and like, you know, not, um, not prioritize the like biological functions or like physical <laughs> longevity of my like self and being in the pursuit of other short-term gains. Um, you know, if there were like, you know, systems that could help us to better like regulate or determine when we hit those like thresholds of dis- diminishing returns where we no longer benefit from like Interesting. continuing so down. So if you just try to optimize for a variable that gets ignored, but if you're also trying to consider this other variable, which is health, then it's okay. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah. makes sense. Um, it's just a I could buy that. Topic. No, no, no. I mean, this is this is healthy. I, I think this is a really good discussion. And I'm glad you're telling me this because it's given me empathy, which is always good. I, you know, at, at least from you know the the time that I've known you, um, yeah, definitely. I always like you, Kenny. Seen hmm? like you and I have always seen eye to eye. I feel like as long as we've known each other. Yeah, um, and I've. Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen and, and, and felt that empathy. Oh, now I'm getting like squishy, but you know. Um, <laughs> Same, I, mean, I just said what I said. It, yeah, when it, there's, there's such a difference between, you know, empathy towards others versus, um, you know, empathy or whatever number of like synonyms, you know, can describe the reflection of those things towards oneself. Um, and yeah. <laughs> I think I'm also just like, you know, throwing out things that I've been wanting to convince myself of. And, <laughs> um, and, and this is just um, an in, in interesting school. setting to, yeah. I mean, um, I was yeah. on the verge of sanity. I, I, it was so much work. They hit you with everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would assume Carver is similar to CMU, but like, I mean, I, I really, I mean, they, they really did push me to limits my endurance. And I'd like to think I'm mm-hmm. a strong human being and I can handle more than 99.9% of people can, plus three nines. However, <laughs> I mean, CMU is good at breaking that. Mm hmm. And so grad school is weird. I mean, I don't know. I, I used to want yeah. to get another degree. I don't think I do anymore. Maybe an MBA. I don't think a PhD. Yeah. Um, there's some good executive MBA programs out there. I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I know, mean, Wharton really seems appealing. One. Yeah. Um, I don't know who went there. Possibly got that in, in the long distance, but... You know, who nice. knows? Yeah. Are you going for um, it, you said? Um, it, I, I think it's more of a just kind of like uh, consideration to cast out there, um, but not to act on anytime soon. Um, I, I think I've just always been interested in like diversifying, you know, knowledge and, and skill sets. Yeah, and so, makes sense. you know, the idea of, um, yeah. You know, especially if I spend, you know, a few or several years in, in government and, you know, public service, public policy, um, and it feels like it's an appropriate time to like step out of that world and back into, um, the, the private sector or to do something different, you know, yeah, that could be a good. I hurt the private sector, but (laughs) that's the idealist in me. And I realized that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, like I said, I'm glad you have the balls to tackle what I don't have the balls to tackle. Um, you know, and I think the, the thing that I've learned more about the private sector, though, um, is uh, so, yeah, like I, I, I've been um, pursuing, uh, you know, this route because of that certain set of like things that I'm existentially anxious about um in terms of like you know technology u.s china stuff all that um but i think even while i've been here at at, um you know in in grad school uh 
I've also gained like new perspective on just how influential the private sector is in shaping all of these things. It's um, more efficient you know, than the government by a long shot, like maybe an order of magnitude. Absolutely. It, or it, yeah, the, the efficiency, you know, the, um, the, um, the, the level of influence and, you know, there's, there's well, organizations like, Oh, please. Yeah. Nah, it's a minor interjection. I would say Lockheed Martin knew that with skunk works. Mm-hmm. And so even though they were a government contractor, they used private contractor vendors because they understood that they were faster, quicker, less expensive. Absolutely. And, and, you know, they, um, they control or they shape so much of that machine of like, you know, the, the revolving doors in and out of I government. Mean, it's just competition. Like, you know, it's, it's the yeah. fact that they bid against one another. I mean, university of Pittsburgh medical center where you used to live, where I live pays about, um, a 10th of the price for a titanium fastener. In a biological implant, the VFW pays. VFW, sorry, um, the uh, the VA or VA, yes. Oh, I, I apologize, yeah. but that's what it is. And so I've heard these <laughs> anecdotes, but I mean, it, it's just they don't negotiate. The government doesn't negotiate. Yeah. So I think it's like a hundred eight bucks for a bolt that costs like UPMC like ten bucks. Yeah. Which, which is probably still like well overpriced, but like uh, sure. Man. Uh, well, titanium is expensive. It, it's because it's a scarce natural resource. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I had a buddy of mine uh, from way, Siberia contact me after you. Wait, no, I, I was, I think I was going to ask about this, like, um, with, with all of those, like titanium, uh, you know, uh, I don't remember if they were rods or if they were like, you know, they with that? Uh, rectangular. Um, I, I, I think the last time I, I saw you, uh, you were you were showing me like photos of just like this shit ton of titanium. Two to four like, tons of titanium. <laughs> Dimitri like offered tons. two and four ton lots of titanium. I'm just like, dude, where the fuck am I going to move that much titanium? The only buyers are defense companies and they don't want anything to do with Russia. And so it's a very complex sales problem to be in i mean it was it was interesting um i say i try to stay out of politics but i mean you know <laughs> no um, i want to make money so i am i i am curious like um how much of like you know whether it's titanium or, or the it's other like material production how much of it is like actually traceable um, oh, like, I mean, traceability, you don't typically worry about that when you're just buying materials okay. legitimately. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are edge cases. So when Lockheed Martin um, Skunk Works built the SR-71 Blackbird, mm-hmm. uh, which is a spy plane that went over Russia in the 80s, yeah. I believe, maybe the 70s as well. Uh, but one of the fastest planes that is declassified, Mach... Uh, 3.7, I think, but I could be wrong on that. Um, mm. Anyway, uh, they bought the titanium from Russia to build it, which was the country they were spying on with the plane. Yeah. And so the paradox is evident. And um, they had a cover for that. <laughs> and this is funny because the cover was a titanium cookware company. Titanium's thermal ex- Thermal expansion coefficient is not conducive to making cookware, so. So they didn't even do their homework on it. Say again. <laughs> oh, no, so, so so they um, created this cover and didn't even do their like homework. They um, might have, but they didn't really think it possible. through. There is yeah. titanium cookware that exists, but it's more for camping than anything else. Because mm-hmm. lightweight. Yeah. yeah. Um. No, that's that, that's interesting. I, I I think I've just been thinking uh, um, more about this kind of stuff with all the different like uh, supply chain you know issues like every everything from people talking about like um, a, well I guess this was more a few years ago but like applying blockchain to everything to actually like <laughs> the more kind of um, in in terms of the, the fabrication or like you know the the, the processes that people use where there might be like um, uh, 
elements within you know the the molecular structures of certain materials that could be traced to certain like um extraction extrusion like you know brr, whatever number of words for things as opposed to um to others i i i know very little about material science and like extrusion is pushing, pushing material through a die mm -hmm. like a long piece of stuff is that what you're yeah. referring to yeah, yeah. Just, um, I, I, I think I was just throwing out, you know, uh, random words that I could think of yeah, that were extraction, related to the thing processing out of, thing. of materials. Uh, yeah, got it. So materials processing, materials uh, cultivation. As yeah, word. like like for I, I think word. what I was thinking of um, is with a lot of like the um, like the three D printed metals. And the ways that people are creating different, um, you know, printable alloys, and how much like um, IP there is around the kinds of like uh, I don't remember if they call them um, powders or it's like the all all the different like um, the the the. the <laughs> um, some entire yeah, alloys. The, 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 the pebbles, the, the little like pebbles yeah. of, of things that um, it's, people. It's, it's all the materials in. mixed together and shaken up like yeah. a cocktail. It's an alloy. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I imagine that a lot of those alloys that people have developed, is, especially for, um, you know, uh, aerospace grade, like, you know, I mean, 3D that's a printed you know, fuselages. Wait, the, wait the aerospace. The reason I say that is because aerospace uses so many materials. Okay. So I, I um, had some friends that were a South by Southwest. Uh, they won the pitch competition. And they had mentioned that there was somebody there pitching a scooter that used aerospace grade aluminum. And okay. my I, one I, friend I was like 6061, which is, it's a basic bitch aluminum. It's, yeah. it's what you buy off McMaster when you want aluminum. And so gotcha. um, uh, they were like, so, yeah, 6061. And, but they use that in airplanes, so it's aerospace grade. Yeah. Um, it, it's like, um, you know, my, my military friends who have talked about, like, military grade stuff basically also Mil being shit. Like, hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah I, so, so what I was thinking about was actually um, a, a friend of mine who – um, started uh, or you know co-founded Relativity Space, and so they like um, you know they they print um, they have a bunch of like their own alloys that they've developed, as well That's as cool. these like twenty two foot like robotic um, arms that three D print like uh, uh, rocket fuselages and engines um, that are uh, so not aerospace but like space grade. You know they're. Um, contracting with um, you know various commercial space companies um, oh, to be the preferred. Space being. They're selling to commercial mm -hmm. rather than government. That's that's cool. Yeah, I, I think I think so. And and they're um, they're one of the preferred vendors for when like, I used um, to work at SpaceX and Elon did not want to hire anything out. So that's interesting. Yeah, well, I I think it's like the components of different missions where. If you can 3D yeah, print a rocket engine, I mm -hmm. mean, you can do that with the very expensive titanium muscle S printer. But if you can do that with technology that you can replicate on Mars, that's valuable. That's that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the moon base, the Mar Mars base, like that's that's the specific use case that relativity has been like you know building towards uh, like to it. be the the arms the software and the alloys that the rockets bring to those spaces uh, to then print additional rockets from Badass. um yeah um so yeah um shout out to to Tim Ellis and like the good work that um he and his crew are doing. Here's to you, Tim. <laughs> well, that's yeah. the thing about a pandemic and a crisis in general is that this is a Rockefeller quote, but I feel like um, bad businesses fail, good businesses thrive. Yeah. No, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating, you know, space that's like, wild west 
tech world. Um, in I love it. I don't know. I, I've got to I've got confidence. Wild West. Hmm? Sorry, but I said what I what I said overzealously is that I do not want it to stop being the Wild West. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's maybe a bit of an addiction, but also yeah one of my favorite things in the world and that is conquering difficult problems absolutely um well, now I, fight. Can, I don't know what's why you're doing it i mean i do i, I want people to be better off but at the same time competition drives me i um i'm, I'm trying to remember that quote um about um about heroes living long enough to see themselves become the villains. <laughs> um, and I, really like this. Um, I, I might even look it up, but um, yeah, the, the, the whole idea just being like that kind of contrast between, um, between the core, the empire, the status quo, um, that is the contrast to the wild west, the frontier where um, on on the one hand, you have the order You're and the rules and all of consolidating. this. You're expanding versus consolidating. Exactly, and you know, um, I I would like to believe that you know the uh, the frontier is endless. Um, uh, oh, and <laughs> uh, the uh, what is it? Congress recently reproposed the Endless Frontier Act Wait, what? to. Uh, um, what is that? Oh, yeah. So. There was an Endless Frontier Act um, during kind of the space race um, to uh, to invest in like breakthrough uh, technologies to like you know get people yeah you know it, it's just like the the whole space race Cold War like let's pursue these endless frontiers of like technological development um, but endless more recently being like within the past moonshot. Exactly. Yeah, the the moonshot equivalents of things, and now um, within. I capitalize on uh, this. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, like it, I think it was within the last month where um, Congress, like you know, proposed a new Endless Frontier Act, uh, and the whole idea about being like uh, really investing R and D in um, ten. Uh, I I think it was like ten core like frontier and emerging technologies and so like you've got ai and and robotics but also quantum and like you know other other kinds of things space you know for sure um oh sorry i was i was looking up the heroes become the villains (laughs) that's all right i was gonna say as a small business owner the problem with stuff like that is that the government is a motherfucker to try to do business with they are so draconian in the record keeping we've applied to just two but two sbrs and every time we do it i say never again <laughs> it's a pain in the ass it's not worth it it's SBIRs i, I, I don't want to say too much work because i work my ass off every day what mm-hmm. i want to say is too little reward for the amount of work you're putting in yeah it, it's a crapshoot and the government has this diva mentality of, if you want to work with us, you should be grateful for the opportunity. And my mentality is, I have That's plenty a bullshit of mentality. private sector clients who pay me better than you to do mm-hmm. a healthy amount of work to achieve their goals. And when I say healthy, what I mean is, I am working efficiently, I'm working hard, I'm working my ass off, but it is with an aim in mind. It is not with... Yeah this this las vegas you know could it happen or could it not you know? mm-hmm. so i i'm sorry to rant kenny no no rant rant away like yeah, i appreciate you i you're a good friend and i appreciate you and and, and you. whatever ideas you want to rant or like convey in any other you know method <laughs> uh, thank you no, we worked on two of them, and each one I, I just left not wanting to work on that sort of thing. This private sector, I can wrap my head around. I mean, that's interests. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. You deliver a result and you get paid, or y- you can captivate uh, companies which are made of people, so people to want to 
put money in your direction to achieve something they want. And I'm confident mm-hmm. that we can achieve uh, results in that way. Because, you know, if you prioritize, if you put your resources in a clever place and you're smart, you can do good things for your clients. However, the government was so stringent on what they wanted. They're like, you got to have our second SBIR. We did not even get considered. And I put a lot of effort into it, 160 hours of my time. And we didn't even get considered because there was some box that needed to be ticked on a form that I forgot about. I'm really oh. good at private sector contracts. I will kick someone's ass in a negotiation every time. My mom was a corporate litigator. I am bred mm-hmm. to be the best at negotiation. I really am. But the way the government does it is different because it feels, it's not even negotiation. It's just like, we have this arbitrary set of rules and if you don't meet it, you can go fuck yourself. It's uh, bureaucratic at best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why I respect you is because you have the balls to try to influence that system in a positive way. Uh, I mean, um, oh, oh, this, this brings us full circle to, um, so I, I didn't realize this quote was from The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> of all things. It. But you either die a hero or live long enough um, to see yourself become the villain. Um, and, and so I think for me, uh, yeah, what I, what I really would hope is that by choosing to dive into this system that has so many flaws and incongruities and like just crazy shit that I don't end up becoming, you know, absorbed into that and, you know, become a tool and instrument of of that same thing in the same way that we were just talking about, like what used to be leading edge, innovative, like frontier startups that were developing things that never existed before, you know, becoming the Facebook Zuckerberg empires of the world that are going to stop at no end to consolidate consolidate and retain power That's even around like deeply flawed business models and like For sure I actually arguable... Kenny, I am so proud I stopped using Facebook two years ago. Power of the people. <laughs> Kudos to you, my, my friend. It was it was a Skinner box, you know, like addictive piece of software. And it's yeah. easy to break. All you have to do is say, I'm going to change all my passwords to fuck Facebook with a bunch of characters at the end. And then that gets it in your head that Facebook is the enemy. And then you mm-hmm. just stop using it. Yeah. To this day, all of my passwords... I'll say this on the air because there's an alphanumeric at the end of it that you're not going to guess. Is <laughs> fuck Facebook with a bunch of characters. Because every time I log into anything, which That's is amazing. probably like 10 times a day, you have to think that. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, it you know, you, you got to de Skinner box the Skinner box. You know what I mean? You condition yourself yeah. not to be conditioned. Um, uh, you know, for, uh, for you or anyone, um, yeah, in, in your audience, um, I highly recommend the book, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. I am going to look that up. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty much just like a really incisive dissection of um, the business model for, for Facebook, also, you know, Google and um, essentially any company that's like, um, uh, uh, built its like, you know, exponential rise within the last like decade, decade and a half based on the, um, intrusive data mining of users to sell to advertisers or other, you know, um, actors like in, in order to essentially create a, user base and population that is highly predictable and controllable um, to be able to better sell things to. Um, on top of like, 
you know, additional kind of insidious like things that people can use it for, such as like uh, manipulating elections and destabilizing, you know, uh, diff varying degrees of democracy around. That happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Does so, but like surveillance capitalism? That's yeah, no, real I, shit. I found it on Wikipedia, but I want to download the actual audiobook. Mm -hmm. I unsubscribed to Audible because I've been trying not to do software as a service on a subscription basis. But I will find this. Please do. Um, Remind me if I don't because it sounds good. Yeah, next time, next time we chat, I, I'd be really curious to hear um, hear your thoughts because. Um, Zuboff uh, introduces a ton of like really fascinating, sticky ideas, like things that people have picked up on. Um, and at the same time, like there's, you know, pretty controversial elements to her arguments as, as well. She's like academically, philosophically, like a deep down Marxist when it comes to her, like, you know, uh, um, her, you know, her, her training, her like research, and her approach to like analyzing uh, capitalistic like you know structures of you know production. That is that is very of, interesting to have a Marxist analyzing capitalism because I mean I would like to hear her conclusions honestly. Yeah. Um, she's she's got a lot of a lot of interesting things. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing is I, I feel like life is so gray. It's not black and white. And, and to get the nuance and philosophies intersecting in the edge cases, I mean, that's the interesting stuff to me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear, you know, like, hey, it's sunny in California. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, I want to hear like, Here's something you weren't expecting. This, you know, think about it. You're 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 speaking my language, my friend. Uh, gray has been my favorite color since middle school, um, precisely for you know that kind of uh, rejection of overly simplistic binary like reductions of well, that's you know, what it is. The universe. Um, and, and I think nuance is probably my most overused word of the last few years you and me because both. I, yeah, I just continually decry like lack of it in any kind of like, Do whether you think it's you know, the general or, population is capable of understanding nuance. I, would I so. the optimist in me like actually believes so, you know, that, that every person has the capacity um, for nuanced thinking. And it's more the product of the social environments in which they're embedded that, that tend to so push the prioritization of like a tribalist, you know, us versus them. Yeah, it's mentality. that rah, rah, rah sports team nonsense that people spout. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, we're on the losing side of the battle, um, you know, against tribalism, partisanship, and, you know, otherwise, like, divisive um, forces that benefit from us being, you know, further removed from each other and unable to, like, understand and empathize with others. Yeah. That is unfortunate because empathy, I think, is the great connector. I mean, it is. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I mean, I think about what you might be thinking and I feel closer to you. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, we need more of that. Part of what are you leaving special as, you know, social animals and, um, you know, yeah creatures that have been able to establish these kinds of like complex social structures, everything. Uh, but you know, who, who knows if we're, 
um, reaching some kind of a, a, a threshold. Uh, oh, what, what, what is it? Um, the whole thing with like Drake's equation and why like there aren't more aliens in the universe. What is Drake's equation? There, um, uh, yeah, there, there was like, um, uh, I, I don't remember what Drake's first name was, but <laughs> the, the, <laughs> I know this, George this Carlin, but that's exactly it, this. about like um, how how many alien civilizations there should exist in the universe, <laughs> and just like um, you know, uh, so the hypothesis comparing, is they're not showing up. Yeah, like um, the 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 number of like stars, um, the galaxies in the universe, and like stars in each galaxy, and the probability of life-sustaining planets that might orbit you know stars and the all of the different things that would um uh predicate the creation of life let alone intelligent life and um you know just yeah this underpinning to the whole mystery of like why haven't we discovered aliens or they discovered us um and part of it um uh, part of the the theory that involves from there is just like this concept of of a great filter, you know that um, that the the majority of intelligent civilizations end up reaching a point where um, internal divisions and conflict end up self is self annihilating that civilization before it is able to reach a point where it can facilitate interstellar communications. Um, and I just really fear that um, <laughs> we're approaching that that kind of a point where the limits of our empathy need to contend with people just wanting to like destroy the shit out of each other. Um, so what you're saying or, is that or, like yeah. an alien is coming close and they're like, these motherfuckers are about to nuke each other. I'm gonna get out of here. No, I, I think you know, it's it's um, it's not even that the aliens like witness our conflicts and like get out of there, but they don't even have the chance to interact with us because the span of you know human civilization that has had the capacity to um, facilitate like not even interstellar but in, inter, interplanetary communications it's been less than a hundred years that we've been sending like radio signals and um, and like Voyager spacecraft out into we did that you know, in the 30s hmm? we did that in the 30s and 20s I, I, um, I don't think so. I, I think, um, I mean, we, we had radio like, uh, we did for, for, for a while, but we, we haven't had strong enough radio, like towers and technology to propagate those signals, like outside of our planetary system. Um, but you know, we sent like right. Voyager out, um, and you know, we've, we've been, I think we yeah there there were other kinds of broadcasts um, in the last like several decades and, and stuff but um, you know even just contending with like the the the, the, the speed of, of light or the much slower speed that, like Voyager is going to go. Well, out I mean there. that's like, an interesting thing, right? Because you know you're like I'm going to send this message, but you're not going to hear it for a while. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be um, hundreds of, of years before it reaches um, an intelligent, like alien civilization. And if you know, they choose to answer years, or, or even exist within the realm of being able to listen to our message. Yeah, I mean, we, we, there may be an intelligent species that just doesn't get the message because mm -hmm. maybe their equipment wasn't turned on at that point. Or I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. It's worth doing. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of complicated factors. So tying this back to our conversation about China, um, I, I, another recommendation that I have is uh, the Three Body Problem um, trilogy. It's a it's a novel, um, or it, it's it's a set of three novels by 
China's most um, most popular and acclaimed sci-fi author. Um, his his name's Liu Liu Sixing um, or Sixing Liu. Um, and yeah, the 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 three body problem, which pretty much like yeah, just um, explores. I just a, texted it to you, by the way. Hmm? What is that? I was selfish, so I texted it to you. To remember oh yeah, no, I, I I just got it. Yeah, um, but but seriously, like yeah, this um, uh, if if this trilogy was not life changing, at the very least, it was like deeply fascinating and continues to you know pervade my thinking about like a bunch of different things but um it's it's um you know it's a a series of novels about um how the world responds when earth um begins communications with a superior alien civilization that's interesting that um is uh that is based um, in you know a star system that's like four and a half like light year light years away, but would take four hundred years for them to travel from there to Earth. And it turns out, hey, that you up? They actually. <laughs> yeah. What what is that? I was joking, like down. Oh, on hey, you up. hey yeah. you up? Yeah. No, exactly. And then you know. There's the, you um, got 400 years to spare. You want to hang out? <laughs> it's sci-fi. It's politics. It's philosophy. It's all these things, and you know, it's yeah. th- there's Four this body whole problem. three body problem. Yeah, there's there's this tension about like you know whether the aliens are coming to like peacefully integrate with us or just like conquer the shit out of humans. As they could. Yeah, it just continues to expand, um, and That's uh, interesting. yeah. It, all sorts of interesting things about um, uh, this question of like whether or not there's life in in the rest of the universe, um, the frontiers of how ballistically you know, there is technological I mean, innovation, um, and yeah, politics, all, all that jazz. So that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, read it if you have it's, the it's arrogant to assume there isn't, right? I mean, because statistically, there probably is. We, yeah, we would think, we'd like, we'd like to think. I mean, um, we, we know about nine planets and we're one of them. I mean, <laughs> there's trillions. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, e- yeah, even, even the fact that, um, so yeah, we've discovered thousands of exoplanets within the last like decade but yeah. we still know nothing about whether or not like they I didn't know that they actually have life on them. Um, How would you? And I mean, what kind of instrumentation would we need for that? It would be pretty insane, I would think. Yeah. No, I, I think for the most part, um, the detection of those exoplanets have mostly been based on um, uh, I don't know if it's radio, but like the the type of spectrometry um monitoring like distant stars where they see fluctuations in um the spectrographic like signals that they get from these stars and um they can tell when planets like move in front of those stars based based on the minuscule dimming of um of uh how much light is being received from those as well as seeing um wavelengths of um of different elements in what could be those planets atmospheres yeah Uh, and so when they detect like oh here's a star system that has a planet with oxygen or like nitrogen or hydrogen both yeah it's crazy shit like it's incredible what we've been able to like you know probability of life equals high yeah Mm mm-hmm they're they're able to detect like planets that have water or you know um that are that are made out of diamonds okay. <laughs> diamonds seriously yeah it, we should it, mine it's those some, planets it's but like 
what I'm really trying to say is the ones that could sustain life are probably very interesting for that's that's fascinating that it all exists. Yeah. Um uh it's it's called uh fifty five cancri e. Um and uh yeah, it was discovered in, in two thousand twelve and uh you know, they, they were somehow able to determine that, like, uh, some planet orbiting some distant star uh, was made out of, like, uh, yeah, carbon structures that, diamonds. like, were the equivalent of, yeah, what we call diamonds. You know, carbon like, that's been just pushed very hard. Yeah. So it's got to be a but, big But the thing is, like, like yeah, you know, the, the, the value of diamonds is entirely, like, socially fabricated. Yeah. You know, like, they're... Uh, yes, it's that that shit's hard. I guarantee know? on that planet they're not worth jack shit. Because nobody has jack shits to give. Because and because there's exists. nobody that exists because it's, the gravity is so high, you would die if you landed there. I would think. Yeah, you know, if if there was enough pressure to just like create a bunch of diamonds yeah. out of like whatever, then you're gonna um, die. <laughs> You fucking die if you land there. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> who, who who the fuck knows? Like, um, uh, I mean, what is it? Somebody, um, it, there were there were recent developments on warp drive technology. Wait, what? Um, what? What? I believe you. I'm just fascinated. Yeah. No. Um. Uh. Yeah, I, I think it was in within the last uh, few months. Um, but that's interesting. Um, so, um, I, I, so I do not have you know the the chops or like the background to even talk about um, uh, the, uh, this stuff. But we can um, get someone involved. Like literally, us. literally within within the past, you know, uh, few, few weeks or months, there have just been some really interesting papers and developments about like people who, yeah, scientists who have like, um, expanded the frontiers of what, um, possible, like implementable warp drive, like technologies could theoretically be, you know, created. And, what I imagine is that for the most part, like it's um, at, at best uh, applicable in like, you know, really minuscule mini scales. And so it's not like we're going to have a warp spacecraft in the next hundred years or so, but you know, who, who knows, like maybe we'll surprise ourselves. Um, but cr crazy shit, not, not gonna, not gonna rule it out. <laughs> yeah, and research is fascinating because, on the one hand, I am cynical, and that the engineer in me wants to say, it's all bogus, none of that stuff. But like, really, at the end of the day, we wouldn't be here without that stuff, mm -hmm. because research drives engineering, and that's the predecessor for sure. Mm -hmm. They're symbiotic. Sure. One doesn't exist without the other. And so, yeah, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, a, a set of lessons around, like, yeah, a, a, a lot of the different themes that we've talked about is, you know, um, that combination of, of staying humble, staying, you know, Curious. Um, the more I learn, the more humble I am. Right. Yeah. And um, you know, yeah, trying to uh, trying to take on and adapt to the 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 crazy shit that you know the universe might throw our way, like within our lifetimes, whether it's from like our our business dealings or our efforts to like shape public policy to prevent like 
you know, global annihilation, or, you know, if it's about like alien civilizations and like, you know, developing. So that we can have a comprehend coming in and intervening. That would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's so much that we don't know that we don't know. Um, Everything. If 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 we recognize that, then um, at the very least, we won't limit ourselves with the hubris of like um, trying to hold on to things that we think we know. Yeah, no, I, I I agree, and I I, I think you got to be fluid because if life has taught me anything, it's that you don't know what's going to happen next. Absolutely. Hey, if you like what you just saw, please smash that like button, click subscribe. It's your support that'll let us keep doing this. We can improve our production value, start releasing these more often. The more people like it, the more of these we're going to put out. So if you like it, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you so much. You're the best.